Hi, and uh, welcome to this installment of Frank and Mary here in Hudson. If you haven't seen this show before, my name is Art Bergeron. Uh, my day job is as an elder law attorney at Myrick O'Connell. But as you know, this is not about my day job. This show is about my friends, Frank and Mary, whom you've seen, if you've seen my presentations at the Senior Center. Their goal in life is very simple. They want to live in their house until they die and be buried in the backyard. And so the purpose of this program is to let them know the people they need to know and the programs they need to know about in order to do just that. And so I've invited for this show, my friend, Steve Pepe, um, who uh, is in his, his day job was for many years, just as a lawyer, um, although he has been working actually full time now for quite a few years um, for a reverse mortgage funding company. And I wanted him to come on because he's probably the most knowledgeable person that I know about reverse mortgages. You've heard me talk about reverse mortgages in many of my seminars. I'm actually doing a seminar uh, in, in, in January talking about planning to stay home, trying to figure out how you can stay home in which I in, and in the seminar, I go through this kind of model with Frank and Mary kind of looking at what are the things they may need in order to fix their house in order to stay home as they get older? How much money, money do they need to kind of set aside for care in case they need care when they're getting older? Because at some point, Frank and Mary will get older. And if Frank needs the help, you know, Mary's kind of the same age. So, you know, you can't ask her to be, you know, helping Frank out in the way she would have when the two of them were like 70 and all of a sudden they're 80 or 85 or 90. So, but then at the end of that presentation, I talk about, so how are the, what are the mechanisms that you can use if you don't have enough cash to be able to fund these things, to be able to take care of these expenses? And if you're planning the future, and so it isn't a current worry, but it's certainly a future worry of what to do. Kind of how do you figure that out? And one of the options that I go through uh, is reverse mortgages. But I wanted Steve to talk about this because there are, you know, I've been doing this now, I've been doing this work, well, I've been practicing for, actually it'll be 40, oh my God, like 45 years next year, this year. Um, that's a lot, right? No, 44 years this year. Um, and But the last many years, like 20 years, have been really focused on these issues around seniors. And I've constantly gotten what I'll call, you know, the, the same myths that I've heard about reverse mortgages kind of, you know, thrown at me. And, and, and so I thought that it would be useful to talk to somebody who does nothing but this, because some of the myths were more true 20 years ago, but they're less true now. So, um, Steve Pepe, can you, can you kind of start off by telling people a little bit about yourself and how you ended up doing this stuff? And then we'll talk a little go in a little bit into the myths and about reverse mortgages. Steve, I can't hear you. You're muted. Very sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you, Art, for having me on. I'm, I'm very excited to be here. Uh, so I uh, live in Milford. I live there with my wife, and I've been in the reverse mortgage industry for uh, just shy of 17 years. This February will be, uh, will be 17 years working on the lending side. And uh, before that, while I was practicing law, I, I was an attorney at a nonprofit agency. And I work now as a loan officer for, for a company named Reverse Mortgage Funding. Our Massachusetts branch office is in Marlboro. So I love what I do. I help people like Frank and Mary uh, access some of the uh, equity they have tied up in the four walls of their home to help solve some of their liquidity challenges they have. You know, during their retirement years where they might be on a fixed income, they're living longer and they're seeing their other retirement assets dwindle and dwindle. But cost of living living is going up and up, especially when those when those in home care costs come into play. Art. And, you know, and so and, and thank, thanks for that you know, background. And once again, I, you know, I talk to people, you know, not on un, not unusually. I talk to people who are in crisis. They're trying to figure out things right now, you know, and somebody's health has has kind of declined, and they were hoping that you know the relatives would step in, but the relatives are getting burned out, you know, or the spouse is getting burned out, and they're trying to figure a lot of this stuff out. But I also talk to a lot of folks who just have that worry in the future, and they're just trying to kind of 
think think this out. And, and I often tell them, I say, well, you know, you've got this home. And the reason why you're watching this show is that your goal in life is to stay in that home. This is like a big deal for you, right? And so, you know, at some point you may want a, a vehicle to be to, the, to be using your home as the vehicle to stay at home, right? right. Um, and, and I'll often talk to them about, I'll say, well, you know, you can go down to the bank, you know, and talk to them about uh, trying to borrow some money that will allow you to do that, not through a regular first mortgage, but through a, what I, I commonly refer to now as HELOCs or home equity lines of credit. They were, they were, they were um, kind of referred to by different names over time. But then I'll say, well, of course, then you could also look at doing a reverse mortgage. And people were like, oh, no, I'd never consider a reverse mortgage. And I'm like, well, OK, right. you know, but 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 be, be for all of those people who would just never consider a reverse mortgage. Can you can you just kind of talk about how a reverse mortgage work, how the reverse mortgage would compare to this home equity line of credit? And I'm sure you've heard people. I mean, some people wouldn't even talk to you, but for those who have, I'm sure you've heard these same issues from talking to people. Can you talk to them about some of those issues that you've, that you've heard them talk about? And then I'll ask questions. I may interrupt you to ask questions as we go along. Okay. Of course, of course. So think of a reverse mortgage just as another kind of home equity loan. It's just got some different features to it that a traditional HELOC or home equity line of credit wouldn't. So a reverse mortgage enables you to borrow a percentage of your home equity that you have tied up in the four walls of your home. Again, for there are two reverse mortgage programs in Massachusetts. For one, you have to be 62 or older. The other, you have to be 60 or older. And what a reverse mortgage enables you to do is borrow that equity without incurring a new monthly mortgage payment that you have to make back to the lender. So you can borrow money against your equity without having a new bill. And if you were on a fixed income during retirement, that, you know, that's a very important thing. You want to decrease your overhead, not increase it. In fact, the most common reason why our phone rings is people have a traditional first mortgage or a HELOC. And that monthly payment has just become too large of a burden because they're retired or they're approaching retirement. And now they can't afford that payment anymore or their financial advisor is telling them, look, if you keep this up, you're going to be out of money in 10 years. Well, you're only, you know, 68 years old. That takes you to 78. A lot of people are very, very healthy at 78. So then what are you going to do? Right. So with a reverse mortgage, as long as you are paying your real estate taxes, paying your homeowner's insurance on your home keeping your home in good shape, and those are promises you're making on any mortgage, Art, then you don't have to ever make any payment back to the lender. A reverse mortgage gets paid back when one of three things happens. You either selling the house, you've died, and if there's two or more of you, you you've all died, or you've moved out of the home for more than 12 consecutive months. Or if there's two or more of you, you have all moved out for more than 12 consecutive months. That's when a reverse mortgage is paid. Normally, when that happens, the house is worth a lot more than what the reverse mortgage balance is. So at the closing, you know, if the house is going to be sold, the, the house is sold, the reverse mortgage lenders paid back what they're owed. And then the the homeowner or their estate, if the homeowner isn't around anymore, the estate gets whatever's left over. And then their estate plan says what happens to that money. So with a regular HELOC or home equity line of credit. Excuse me, Steve, I just want to stop you for a second because I want yeah. to go through a couple of the points that you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. So first of all, you know, you you pointed out that 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 the that a reverse mortgage is due when the person dies. And I just want to do kind of two additions to that. It is my understanding from reading the reverse mortgage. And by the way, folks, you know, I'm not, the reverse mortgages all read the same way. And the reason why they all read the same way is because um, reverse mortgages, the reason why companies are willing to even do this, uh, even though as a result of the reverse mortgage, at some point, the property could be underwater because the property value could have gone down by so much that it no longer covers the amount of the reverse mortgage. 
They only do this because these are all federally insured. This, this program was started actually during the Reagan administration. Ronald Reagan signed into law the federal law that created these for the, the reverse mortgage program, right? Remember him, right? So, so that w- w- one of the things about that reverse mortgage is that while, while it, it, it is actually not due on death, it's due within a year of the death of the second to die. So that first of all, if you're, if you're the two of you are signing, don't worry that one of you dies and the other one gets thrown out of the house. Secondly, if when the second person dies, it isn't like the bank, the, they show up the next day with the sign that says the foreclosure is happening. Your family or whoever you were planning on giving the property to now has a year from date of death in order to either refinance this. If, if you know, sometimes the property is going to the, a, a, one of the kids and the kids, you know, is going to be able to re, then therefore refinance it or when it gets sold, when it gets sold. So it is not there is not. And at at that point, as Steve says, it isn't like when the reverse mortgages do, the bank gets your house. I have heard that countless times. I don't want to do a reverse mortgage. I'm just giving the bank my house. No, you're giving the bank a mortgage. Just like all mortgages, the mortgage is there to secure the repayment of a loan. You're borrowing some money. If the house then gets sold or refinanced, the amount that gets borrowed has to get paid right? The bank doesn't get the house. So I didn't mean to interrupt, but I think this is, this is, this, this relates, this strikes that line. Oh, the bank's just going to get my house. I can't right. tell you how many people have said that to me. That's right. And, and I'm glad you said that Art, because we hear that so much and I don't know where that came from, but the bank does not get your house and you haven't suddenly transitioned from the owner of the house to the tenant of the house that then the bank can come in and kick you out and change the locks or anything like that. That simply is not true. It just, it's not true. So, and and I know you were going to not start comparing the the reverse mortgage to that kind of the home equity line of credit. So I didn't didn't mean to interrupt you, but I wanted to, that's such a big issue. I wanted to get it clear right off the bat. Right. It's so important. So with a home equity line of credit, right? So you're, you're again, also borrowing money against the equity in your home. But um, first, to qualify for a home equity line of credit, there's more vigorous review of your income and credit. You have to have higher income and better credit. But let's say that Frank and Mary qualify. Um, There will be a period of time where they can withdraw some of that equity out, borrow some of that money, and they will have relatively low monthly payments once once they start borrowing money. They'll have interest only payments that they have to make back to their bank or lender. But then there will be a line in the sand that they cross maybe five years in, maybe 10 years in, where the ability to borrow more money shuts off. And then what turns on is a much bigger monthly payment. They call it a fully amortized payment because then you're making principal and interest payments to eventually pay that debt down to a zero balance at the end of whatever it is, 15 years, 10 years, 20 years. So it's when you cross that line in the sand that Frank and Mary usually panic and pick up the phone and call the kids and the kids call Art and Art calls me or whatever the case may be, because now their $200 payment becomes a $750 monthly payment and they can't afford it anymore. And Steve, I just want to, I just want to interrupt in a second. So by the way, this isn't because, you know, your local bank is, is like, is, this is like some kind of a shyster deal. This is, the, the reason for that is they, they are required, according to their rules, to make sure that the amount that you have borrowed gets paid over at some point turns into a regular, a regular loan that needs to get paid off over a period of time. And that period, that's not going to be like 30 years. It's going to be, as T- Steve says, typically... 10 to 15 years, right? Because that that means that you're going to be paying quite a bit of principal along with interest. That's why that huge jump in the in the payment it isn't like your interest rates skyrocketing, but it's just a function of the way these things work. And and one of the reasons why I mentioned that is that you know people will come as I've mentioned people will come to me in crisis like 
oh my God, you know, you know, Frank, Frank, Frank's call, talking to me and saying, Mary really needs help right now. I hate to dip into my IRA to do that because if I do that, I'm going to be, you know, having to pay the income tax on that. I don't have a lot of savings. And I'll say, well, in that case, you know, look at these two alternatives and, you know, you can get the money out from either one. And, 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 the, and this issue of repayment won't be coming up for quite a few years, right? Because, it, because you're going to have this period, as Steve said, where it's all just interest only. You're going to have to make the interest only payment every month. And so that may itself be a problem. But the, but the big payments aren't going to start for quite a while. If, on the other hand, you're Frank and Mary and you're talking to me now, as in the example that I'm, I'm used in my seminar in, in January, and, and you've got... And, and you're 70 and you're both pretty healthy and you're saying, well, I'm just really worried about, you know, what if I get to be like 80 and I really need this money, right? Well, the problem, if you've got the home equity line of credit at this point, is that by the time you're 80, you may have gone past that period where you can just withdraw money and you may be stuck with the period where you have to start paying it down, right? So it just, it's, it's, it's just really important that you kind of understand these things. Sorry, sorry, I, I, I digress again, but I'm trying to connect it to things that I know people have talked to me about. Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, in terms of interest rates, they're pretty equivalent between the two types of programs, and they're going to be variable for the most part. Uh, closing costs, that's where a HELOC definitely has a leg up on a reverse mortgage. Uh, HELOC, the closing costs, if you have a banking relationship where you go to apply, it may be very low or even nothing. Uh, with a reverse mortgage, they're gonna be higher. Um, and it's because again, they're government insured loans. So there are government insurance charges that make up the closing costs, but those are gonna be rolled into the loan so that they're not out of pocket costs for Frank and Mary. They're uh, finance closing costs. So- And, and Steve, um, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna give you an example because often, I'm talking about Frank and Mary, and I'm using an example where Frank and Mary's own a house that is worth $400,000. That's not an uncommon price in Hudson right now, right? Um, if they were borrowing $400,000, about what would those initial costs be? Order so of magnitude. So those initial Order costs on a reverse mortgage, first, there's a government insurance premium of 2% of the value of the home. So that's $8,000 insurance yeah. premium going to HUD in Washington, D.C. Right. And then there's uh, your third party closing costs for things like the attorney, the appraiser, the recording fees and that kind of thing. That might be another 3,500 or so. Those are very common and typical with any yeah. other mortgage transaction. And then there will be another fee that uh, will be dependent on what interest rate Frank and Mary choose so called an origination fee that might be anywhere from about uh, one to $6,000. So you're looking at uh, eight, 11, so maybe 13 to, to 17, $18,000 for Frank and Mary in finance closing costs. And so one, once again, folks, you know, a big chunk of that money, as Steve just explained, is part of the more basically what you do is you're paying up front a part of that this mortgage insurance premium, which is going into this pot, which is the reason why the Fed, that's the federal government pot to make sure that there's money in case the federal government for some reason needs to pay out on this mortgage. And then there are other costs. This is definitely it's definitely a hit, you know, but remember that you're about you're borrowing a lot of money. And just like in any mortgage, uh, you, you can just you know, take those costs and roll them into what you're borrowing. So it isn't like you're paying a big chunk of money at the time of the closing. And the interest on those costs is just like the interest on money that you would have borrowed. You're going to be paying interest on it at a, a rate, which is basically comparable to the HELOC, to the, to the HELOC rate. Thank you. That's right. That's right. And what, what that mortgage insurance does is it makes a reverse mortgage a non-recourse loan. So that means, as you mentioned, Art, if, uh, if Frank and Mary are lucky enough to live in their Hudson home for the rest of their lives, and then the second one of them passes away, and then the, the family decides we're going to sell Frank and Mary's home, and Frank and Mary's home at that point, 20 years down the road, is worth... Uh, is still only worth $400,000, but their balance is $450,000. They are only on the hook for repaying 95% of the $400,000. So they would sell the home, 
the lender would get $380,000, and then that's it. They're not on the hook for a penny more. The federal government is going to write a check to the lender for the rest of the balance due on the loan. No one else is personally liable for it. Federal government just did a periodic audit of that mutual mortgage insurance fund, as they do every couple of years, and they said it's actually grown quite a bit to a point that there is adequate coverage for the foreseeable future. They're very happy with the amount of coverage in place and in force right now. So the program is not going anywhere. The program is running the way it is supposed to run. So that's yeah. great. That's yeah. great. And so and so the interest rates are about comparable. If you've got a HELOC, you're, you're needing to make these monthly payments. Uh, if you have the reverse mortgage, the monthly payments, if you don't want to make them, just get rolled into the, the, the amount of the, the amount of the, the, the mortgage. That's You've right. got this issue that, that at some point regarding the HELOC, the monthly payments are going to, you know, could grow. That's so, right. So that's, but, but once again, you've got this big high initial cost. So people, even though you can roll that money in, you need to decide whether that's worth, whether that's worthwhile for you. Uh, right. And 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 as Steve said, you you want to be doing the comparison, right, of yep. what you would be getting from both parts. But you also want to be figuring out if you're doing the HELOC whether you qualify. So can you talk a little bit more, Steve, about you had said you know there are income criteria, and I know regarding the the reverse mortgage, certainly the reverse mortgage company wants to make sure that you can make your your tax and insurance payments. Because That's you're right. going to continue to have to make your tax and insurance payments. But yep. it's a little bit different regarding the HELOC. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So for a HELOC, uh, they're, they're looking at your credit report and your credit score. And if that score is lower, you, you might not qualify or you might not get as good of an interest rate. If it's high, then you'll get better rates and terms. Uh, in terms of income, they have to see that your... Uh, that your total household income compared to what your carrying costs are, both your carrying costs for your, your property, the, the payments you'd be making on the HELOC and your taxes and your insurance, as well as your, your regular monthly payments you have to make on all the bills on your credit report, your you know, Frank and Mary's car loan, their Visa card, their, you know, I was gonna say Sears charge card, but Sears is all but gone now. Right. So they're, uh, we're, their getting home old, we're getting car. old, Steve. We're getting old. <laughs> so their Home Depot card. Yeah. They don't have their right. Jordan Marsh card either. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> they have to see that, that the ratio of their income to their debt falls within these very specific ratios. And if it doesn't fall within those ratios, if they're carrying too much credit card debt or they have a Mercedes because they, they splurged on a car. They, they might not qualify or they might qualify. They wanted a hundred thousand dollar HELOC, but they might only qualify for a $40,000 HELOC. And when they're doing those qualifying ratios, they have to see uh, not only can, you know, can Frank and Mary, can they afford that interest only payment at the beginning, but can they afford that fully amortized payment that comes five or 10 years down the road? And can they afford that amortized payment, not only at rates what they are today, but what rates might be in a worst case scenario if inflation hits and that rate starts going up and up and up, can they afford that fully amortized payment at a higher rate based on what their income is right now? And for so many retirees, the answer is no. For my clients who call me because they were rejected for a HELOC, they didn't have a credit issue. They have Frank and Mary's uh, cohort have among the best credit of any of us. They pay their bills, right? They've got 800 FICO scores. It's the income. You know, the income is where they get tripped up on qualifying for anything more than maybe a 20 or 30 or $40,000 HELOC for so many people, if anything. And, and that's where... On a reverse mortgage, it's not a credit score driven product. Uh, we are looking at credit. We're looking at your last two years track record, paying your taxes, your insurance, and your bills on your credit report. And if you've had problems with those things, it's not that you'll necessarily be denied and you won't get worse rates or terms. It's not like you'll get 
the very highest rate or the most expensive product. It just means if you've had some problems in the past two years, we might have to set aside some of the money from the reverse mortgage so that we are paying your taxes and insurance for you. And we've set aside enough money so that we can do that for the rest of your life expectancy. And in terms of income, if it's Frank and Mary, a two person household in the Northeast, Frank and Mary have to show that they have at least $906 a month in what we call residual income. If it's Frank or Mary, a one person household, they have to show they have $540 a month in what's called residual income. So much lower bar to overcome on the income side for qualifying for a reverse mortgage. And it's all geared towards making sure you can pay your taxes and insurance. That's what it's all about. Yeah. And so I guess my kind of broad observation, you know, from, you know, from, from this conversation and what I, what I would really kind of urge people to think about is first of all, in general, if you're trying to figure these problems out, don't just stick your head in the sand and do nothing, right? Because because if you want to make, you know, you, you, you don't want to be losing sleep on, if even if you're not in a, in a crisis now, you don't want to be losing sleep. You don't want to drop dead worrying about whether you're going to have enough money five years from now. Well, that's not accomplishing anything, right? So you may want to, you know, figure out what you may need in the future and then figure out to the extent that you want this kind of cushion whether you want that cushion through a HELOC or through a reverse mortgage, right? And, 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 th and think about both of them and research both of them. And especially kind of regarding the HELOC, just go to the bank and talk it out with the bank. You, you know, it, it's probably going to be the local bank. It's going to be like a video or, you know, it's going to be a local or some a local bank, St. Mary's Credit Union, the local bank you've been dealing with. And, you know, you're not going to get penalized for going in and talking to somebody and saying, you know, I'm just trying to figure this out in case I might need it. Right. And that way you can you can also figure out if if you're look, if you know how much you want to have available um, because you figured out how much you may need in the future. You can also figure out whether the HELOC is even an option because you kind of want to know whether you're going to hit those scores that Steve just described, whether they're going to say, you know, despite the fact that you've been a great customer for a long time, here are the numbers you have to meet in order to demonstrate to us that you could afford a $200,000 line of credit on your $400,000 home, right? Assuming that you've borrowed all the money and that, and that the time for repaying it has come. We need to know, we the bank need to know that you have the ability to do that, right? And then on the other side, you want to talk to somebody. Now, you don't have to talk to Steve Peppy. As I always say at the seminars, and I'm not trying to, to, to I'm not trying to demean Steve Peppy, right? But these reverse mortgages are always about the same, right? I mean, and the reason why they're the same is because of this whole federal piece, because they're all federally insured. When I look at a reverse mortgage, I know that it looks the same as the other company's reverse mortgage, because it's the government's reverse mortgage. You know, the government wrote it, right? So, so, but, but the point is, you know, kind of, talk to somebody if you want to shop it shop it right but but figure out you know apples to apples if you wanted that line of credit right now could you get that line of credit right now right and if you could just kind of compare it right because the goal isn't you know to, i'm not trying to we're not trying to i'm not trying to sell you anything i'm trying to let you know that those are your kind of your two roots if you want the security of knowing that you can use your home in order to stay at home which is the point of Frank and Mary of all my presentations is to help people stay at home until they die and be buried in the backyard. You've heard me say that a bunch of times. So Steve, thanks a million. I realize, you know, for people who are seeing this, this is like, it's the week before Christmas right now. So I appreciate you being able to take some time for the folks who are watching, you know, have a wonderful Christmas, have a wonderful new year. If you're interested in some of these issues regarding kind of planning in order to stay home, you may want to watch my seminar, which, which should be up on, on Hudson Cable, you know, in January. Uh, and uh, if you got any questions, you know, on any of this stuff, please give me a call. So, Steve, thanks a million. Thank well, you. I will ask, I'm asking the folks at Hudson, at, at Hudson Cable to put up your contact information in case anybody wants to reach you. So if you could connect 
with, with Sarah McCoola at, at Hudson Cable. I would really appreciate it. Sarah, I just want to th take the opportunity to thank you. This has been a wonderful year. You tolerate the incompetence of my scheduling, which sometimes bounces all over the place. Thank you so much. And to, and to you all, Merry Christmas, and hope you enjoyed the fall the next year. Thank you.